the River Clyde. Before the 19th century, when certain improvements took place to deepen the water, the, the river was actually quite shallow. Ships couldn't go up the river into Glasgow, and Port Glasgow at that time, before the 19th century, was actually Glasgow's port, and goods either leaving or arriving in Glasgow had to be taken on road from Port Glasgow into the city. But, um, as I say, certain improvements took place uh, throughout the 19th century. They built quays to narrow the river, and in narrowing the channel, that had the effect of making the water deeper. And that, combined with dredging the river, actually made uh, the water deep enough for ships to go right into the centre of Glasgow. But before all that happened, as I say, the river was much wider and a heck of a lot shallower, to the extent that you could actually walk across the river in places. There was apparently three fords across the River Clyde. This right here was one of them. This was called the Marlin Ford. It's just it's at Brayhead right behind uh, Halfords and Sainsbury's and all that stuff. That's where we are. And it, one of the other fords was at Lint House, the Lint House Ford, which was located roughly where the Lint House shipyard used to be, sort of where the Clay Tunnel is now, that sort of uh, spot. I'm not sure where the third ford was, I suspect it may have been just a little further up the river, perhaps uh, closer to Govan, perhaps where the Kelvin meets the River Clyde. Um, I, I think even if there was a ford there, I think there would also have been a ferry round about that area linking Partick with Govan, because it, long ago Partick and Govan were joined at the hip. Uh, it was a kind of centre for the kings of Strathclyde who had their castle in Partick, the royal centre or the kind of religious centre. Uh, it was here in Govan. So you wanted some way of getting between the two across the river. I think there would have been a ferry there for a donkey's years before the river was uh, improved and deepened. The actual depth of the river before all these improvements took place was astonishingly shallow. James Watt, that famous inventor and engineer, made a survey of the river at the mouth of the River Kelvin at Govan in 1770. At high tide it was three foot eight, and at low tide it was just one and a half feet. Walking across it at certain places must have been a doddle. But the improvements were largely successful, and the depth of the water increased to the extent that big ships could come right into the city. At that stage, the fords became just a memory. Any number of businesses sprang up along the riverside to take advantage of the ease with which they could now import and export goods. Engineering works, foundries, potteries, bottle works and even shipbuilding yards. If Glasgow could now accommodate big ships, then maybe it was time to start building its own big ships. You only have to look at the first edition Ordnance Survey map of 1857 to see the extent and variety of industry that grew on the banks of the River Clyde, in this case at Anderston. With all this industry and employment, there had to be a way for men to get to and from their work. Given that the bulk of this industry was by the river, it made perfect sense to actually use the river as a means of transport, and so ferries were built to transport the men back and forth. As I've already said, there had been a ferry between Govan and the mouth of the River Kelvin for donkey's years, well before the river deepening. Other ferries existed, at Renfrew for example, where there had probably been a ferry between there and Yoker going back to medieval times. 
but with the growth of industry in Glasgow, the number of ferries and ferry terminals blossomed. In that same 1857 map, further upstream, you can see the ferry route at Govan, between Water Row and the Point House Inn. Water Row was still a narrow cobbled street lined with thatched cottages, but it now sat by some of the many shipbuilding yards that had sprung up. If you look closely, there are no stairs for getting on and off this ferry, and all there seems to be is what we presume is a sloping bit of ground or ramp. This was for a vehicular ferry, like the one shown here in 1882, used to transport horses and carts and carriages. It was a chain ferry and started operation here in that very year, 1857. A little further upstream, close to where Govan's graving docks would later be built, you can also see a ferry route, but in this case there are stairs at each terminal. The assumption is that this was a passenger ferry. Further upstream, also in 1857, we can see another three ferry routes over the Clyde at Finnison, Clyde Street and York Street, all with sets of stairs leading down to the water and all presumed it to be passenger ferries. As the years went by, changes and improvements took place. More ferries, some going back and forth across the river, and some, called Cluthas, going up and down the river. And by the late 19th century, the ferry had become a staple means of transport for working Glaswegians. At low tide, and it is low tide right now, um, you can often see bits of the river or remains along the banks of things that used to be there, <laughs> like ferry terminals. Um, just behind me, this used to be the Kelvin Hall ferry terminal. Um, you can still see, I think this is probably the best preserved one on the river, you can still see the, the iron arch just above the stairs that led down to where you would get on and off the ferry um, and this particular ferry used to run between here and Highland Lane in Govan and Highland Lane used to sit in the far side of the Govan graving docks which are just over there and I think right there there was also one of the landing stages for one of the Cluthers I think in later maps that you don't see that landing stage and that's simply because the Cluthers didn't last very long on the river. I may already have said at some point. I think they only lasted for the, the 1880s till the early 1900s. Very short-lived um, thing. There used to be an earlier ferry terminal at this spot before the Queen's Dock was built. Queen's Dock, that, that was the entrance to the dock right there. Of course, the dock's now filled in, it's just now a car park. But before that was built, there was another ferry terminal, which I think kind of left from round about there and went kind of over that direction, which was even before the, the graving docks were built. But I imagine when all that activity happened and things getting constructed, they moved the ferry terminal to here and to the end of Highland Lane. The Cluthers did indeed have a short lifespan, in existence between just 1884 and 1903. They were bigger than the smaller passenger ferries that traversed the river, and had 11 landing stages between the city centre and White Inch, where workers could be picked up or dropped off. <laughs> 
Looking at late 19th century maps, we can see many of these landing stages, along with the ferry terminals. At the foot of Water Row and Govan in 1893, for example, we can see the Govan landing stage, one of the Clutha's eleven stops. We can also see the passenger ferry and vehicular ferry route between Govan and Point House by the junction of the River Kelvin. Further up river, we can see the Highland Lane landing stage used by the Cluthas and the route of the Kelvin Hall passenger ferry. Its terminal stairs moved sometime in the early 20th century when York Hill Quay's East Basin was created. At Finneson Quay, we can see all three terminals close together. The stop cross landing stage used by the Cluthas stairs used by the passenger ferries and protruding parts of the quay used, one presumes, to assist guidance of the vehicular ferry as it approached Mavis Bank Quay. The vehicular ferry used at Finneson from the 1890s was in fact called the Finneson. She was an elevating deck ferry with a platform that could be raised or lowered to deal with different tides and could carry up to eight carts and 300 passengers. Here, we see her being launched from William Simmons' shipyard in Renfrew in 1890. And here, we see what is likely to be the same vessel at Finiston, along with two passenger ferries, probably in the early 20th century. The domed structure on the left, called the North Rotunda, is one of the entrances to the Finnison Tunnels, built in the 1890s as a route under the Clyde for both pedestrians and vehicles. This is another view of the ferry terminals at Finniston, this time in 1889. Before steam passenger ferries were introduced in 1868, the passenger ferries at this location were rowing boats. Of all the ferry terminals along the River Clyde in Glasgow here, there's very few of them still remaining. Uh, terminals at Clyde Street, York Street, these have gone. There's no nothing left whatsoever. But there are one or two of them where there's still some sort of architectural remains of them. This, for example, is the Stobcross Street ferry terminal. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a state, but it's, you can sort of get a good idea of what it perhaps once looked like. You've got, the, again, the metal arch over the stairs and a few other bits and pieces. This was both... The stairs was where the passenger ferry stopped at. And you can actually see the uh, iron remains of the kind of chain mechanism that pulled the vehicular ferry back and forth across the river at this stage. Um, this was a pretty short-lived ferry. Um, I think it ran from about 1936 to 1966. It's positioned just at the foot of Elliott Street there. But uh, as I say, it's fairly well preserved. On the other side of the river, that used to be Mavis Bank Quay. And again, you can see the iron remains of the chain mechanism that would, it kind of pulled the uh, vehicular ferry back and forth. And you can also see... Um, it's such stairs for the uh, passenger ferry, although that kind of wood there is all kind of falling apart. That won't last much longer, I don't think. Th this ferry terminal was moved here from 
finishing because there used to be a fairy term roughly where the finishing crane is just now. Uh, it was called um, the Stop Cross Ferry. But I think its name has changed before it closed to the finishing terminal, uh, finishing ferry terminal, and then it was kind of moved lock, stock, and barrel to this location here. But it's just nice to see the iron uh, chain mechanism. It kind of gives you a better idea of how these things kind of worked. But from what I gather, the I could never figure out personally how the, the chain ferries uh, operated. You saw this big chain, and you thought, well. What's that for, you know? But apparently within these uh, ships, there was essentially just a big cog. And the chain ran over it. And uh, by turning the cog, you could move the ship one way or the other and allow, the, allow it to kind of pass from one side of the river to the other. Very kind of basic, but fascinating <laughs> the way it kind of move things, you know? Although the Cluthas had a short lifespan, they carried a lot of passengers. Men employed in shipyards and engineering works along the banks of the Clyde. At their height, around three million passengers were transported in just one year, 1897. Their demise in 1903 was probably down to the availability of other forms of transport like an electrified tram system that became fully operational by 1903. Glasgow's other ferries fell into decline in the second half of the 20th century, and for a variety of reasons. White Inch ferries were withdrawn in 1963 when the Clyde Tunnel was opened. Ferries at Govan were withdrawn in the same year for the same reason. Popularity of the motor vehicle had increased, and Joe Public found driving through a tunnel far quicker and easier than a voyage on a ferry. The Clyde Street Ferry, and indeed Clyde Street itself, went in 1967 to make way for construction of the Kingston Bridge. The Kelvin Hall Ferry clung on until 1980. Renfrew's Chain Ferry was withdrawn in 1984 and is now used as an entertainment venue and berthed right by the Kingston Bridge. Of course, by the second half of the 20th century, Glasgow's label as second city of the Great British Empire no longer applied. The industrial balloon had burst. It now seemed easier and cheaper to import stuff from abroad rather than make it ourselves. And the depth of the river was once again becoming an issue, as huge container ships were unable to come right into Glasgow Harbour. It was a combination of circumstances and a very slippery slope that in the end killed the River Clyde and all the industries that once lined its banks. An absence of workers, combined with an increase in the building of tunnels and bridges, meant that ferries were no longer required. Whenever a bridge is built at a ferry location, you can wave goodbye to the ferry. These days, the River Clyde, perhaps like the city of Glasgow itself, uh, is a mere shadow of its former self. There's hardly any boats or ships going down the river these days. You might see the paddle steamer Waverley now and then, and perhaps the other 
an occasional other vessel, but it's just it's largely dead. Um, all these old cluthers have gone, all the old ferries, whether passenger or vehicular, have gone. And where there was sometimes a ferry route across the river, you've got bridges getting built. And when you've got bridges getting built, uh, the ferries are generally gone. If you think about the Erskine Bridge, used to be a ferry there. There's any number of other areas where there's a bridge now, but it used to be a ferry. But um, it is thankfully here at Renfrew that we do have uh, a ferry, a passenger ferry, a more recent uh, vessel. And that is the last Clyde ferry. I'm Eddie Burns. Take care.